All right, Tim. Tim, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I was born in St. Pete, Florida. St. Petersburg, which yeah, is Bay. Never, we're in Tampa right now. Yeah, so it's across the across the bay. Yeah, it's uh, it's where the Rays Stadium is, and mm -hmm. you know. And tell me about how you grew up. Uh, I grew up pretty good. I grew up, uh, you know, when I was real little, we weren't, you know, we didn't have money. We were lower, considered more or less lower class. Um, my dad was a record producer, and then uh, um, he was trying to do that off and on. And then we moved out to uh, San Francisco for a little bit. Him and my mom were climbing telephone poles. He got into the telecommunications industry, so lived out there for about two years, and then moved back here to Clearwater, and uh, went to elementary school at uh, one or two private schools through like preschool and kindergarten, first grade. Christian, you know, Christian type schools, and uh, you know, uh, after that went to regular public school, elementary school. Um, you know, had a good childhood for the most part. I mean, wasn't anything spectacular, you know, until we started to get into middle school, and my dad hit it big with one of the bands that he produced locally, and uh, you know, got some money. We you know were able to move into a bigger house, and then he got into the telecommunications industry into, you know, uh, call centers, basically. Right. And you uh, you got through high school? Uh, I got through part of high school. I mean, I played football all growing up, so I was, you know, really into sports. I was a quarterback, starting quarterback all through elementary and middle school. But once I hit, like, 14, you know, and went into high school, you know, I let the immaturity and whatnot run wild for a kid and was interested in, girls and partying and all that stuff so that started to lead me down a bad road Tell yeah. me about that. well I started out smoking pot um, here and there um, and then you know slowly moved into LSD and mushrooms and roofies this was back in the 90s so times were a little bit different back then there wasn't the internet and everything like there is now but you know, and I lived in a nice suburb area that, you know, was, uh, you know, more middle to upper class. And so there was really nothing to do out there. Uh, this is over in Palm Harbor across the way. So um, I just had too much time on my hands, you know. Wasn't making the grades in school. So I didn't play high school football like I wanted to and started slipping more off into partying and getting in trouble. Um, got kicked out of school in ninth grade, um, had to, uh, you know, go and uh, move to Illinois to finish my ninth grade year so that I could stay on track with, uh, you know, the rest of my classmates. So did that, came back, you know, did good for a little bit, but then met a girl that was a senior when I was a sophomore. She was going off to Tallahassee to school. so. I ended up dropping out, getting my GED, going to college when I was 16, which looking back now, I would have stayed in high school. And knowing what I know now, obviously hindsight's always 2020, but I would have, you know, stayed in high school and not followed that path. But I did that. And, you know, and when I was up there, I was given so much money and had a dorm, dorm room that was paid for, but I wanted to go and do my own thing. I was in a college town, one of the biggest party college towns in Florida. so. You know, I started, I was good with computers. My dad, his company, obviously, they had computers in the house since I was, since the Commodore 64 and stuff like that way back in the day. So I've always been into computers. And I knew back in the day, Photoshop wasn't a big thing. It used to be Corel Draw. I was really good with Corel Draw. And I knew how to make, I learned how to make, taught myself how to make fake IDs. And so I would do that in college for extra money. And then with that extra money, I would then buy drugs, do them or sell them. And, you know, finally, when I was about a year and a half in, got a knock on the door from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement asking me questions. And luckily, I didn't have anything there. And, you know, they searched the dorm room. And so I skated from that, but was freaked out, obviously. And by the time I was almost 18, moved back down here to Tampa and moved in with a friend of mine. So, and that was during the 90s when, you know, techno music was starting to get real big and the rave scene down here was huge. Got into that. I had new friends that were DJs and performers and stuff. So, 
that took up a lot of my time. And then obviously from that was selling ecstasy and stuff like that, you know, just doing crazy stuff. And then decided to start because I knew computers so well. One day I was behind walking from my house to the gas station over here in Clearwater and walked behind an Eckerd's and there was a garbage bag that looked like it had pill bottles in it. Well, when I opened it up, there was no pills, but there was the other half to the prescriptions prescription bottles the sticker they put on your bottle there's another half to that that they're supposed to keep and shred this was again back in 98 97 so i don't think their their rules weren't as strict as they are now per se so i found a whole bunch of second halves to the prescription bottles with the doctor's name and dea numbers on them and decided to start producing prescriptions and started making the scripts in coral draw and going to Kinko's and mass printing them on different colors of paper so they looked exactly like you would at a doctor. You know, they got different colors and whatnot. This was before they had the special, you know, embossing that they put in them now. But um, And before they, they've got databases now, you could never get away with something like that now. You'd be caught in a second because the doctor's got to input that in on their end in the database, then the pharmacy has to run it. So Where did that lead? Uh, to getting arrested. I used to do that and um, we used to go to dentist's office and hospitals and break in the back shed where they kept the nitrous tanks, excuse me, and uh, we used to steal the nitrous tanks, six foot nitrous tanks and go to parties and sell them and stuff and it was me and my, a couple of my friends and my brother um, and then me and my brother one night were in Tampa doing it. And we thought it was, it, we, the sign said dentist office. It used to be a dentist office, but I guess it closed down and a bar had bought the place out. And we were working on the back door and it was taking too long. And me and my brother told our other friend, let's go, let's go. He didn't want to go. He wanted to keep going. So me and him got in the truck. As we started to drive away around the building, we saw a cop pull up. So we took off, left him there. I mean, because he didn't want to get in the car. We, we knew if he spent more than three minutes there, you were done. I mean, we had blow torches, crowbars, everything, you know, bolt cutters, everything. And this door was steel reinforced because it was for a bar, you know, which none of the other ones are not steel reinforced. So they were a lot easier. And we took, took off, started hauling butt back into Pinellas County from Hillsboro, you know, cause we knew the cops were stopping him and they got us right before the border. And I was, uh, 18 at the time, 19. My brother was 17, so he went to juvie. Had to spend like a month there. I was in county, you know, for a couple of weeks. And, uh, yep, that started all the major legal stuff. I mean, I had been in trouble for possession of pot one time when I was younger, which screwed me up because it suspended, in the state of Florida, they would suspend your license, especially if you're a minor. So I didn't even get my regular license till I was 18 at least, you know, because I had a suspended license for most of my, you know, younger teenage years. So you didn't do that much time? Well, I, you know, got, the judge released me because I didn't have really any charges after a while, got released, bonded out, and uh, had to go back for court and was sentenced to probation. So did probation, but would violate probation, have to go back, and eventually that caught up with me, you know, a little bit more down the road when I had to. And your drug use continued? Uh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, it stopped because I was in jail for a little while. When I got out, I did did pretty good. Um, but yeah, it, it always ended up going back to this, you know, same old friends. When you keep the same people, places and things, nothing's going to change. You know, that's one thing I found out over the years that getting away from all that is the best thing anyone can do, you know, because if you're in the same area or even state, you know the places you can go. You can leave rehab whenever. Because in Florida, at least, they're not. They got rid of mental hospitals and lockdown facilities a while ago. So everything's always been voluntary for the most part, unless you're in jail. And now they have more secure drug programs where if you're on, you know, in jail, they'll call the cops and the cops will come get you if you take off. So it's a lot better now. Back then, I mean, this was, again, in the 90s when before the opiate epidemic and all that stuff, you know, so. And my drug of choice then was more or less Xanax. That's what the prescriptions I was writing. I'd get a bottle of Vicodin too, but 
that wasn't really the big thing back then. It was Xanax, acid, ecstasy, and stuff like that. So, uh, from there, it just, uh, it got worse. I mean, um, in uh, 2000, um, my brother, he when he went to JDC Juvenile, he got sober, started working out all the, I mean, he changed his life considerably, started working out, reading books all the time, stuff he had never done. He used to, he was a good kid, you know, and he uh, raced go-karts professionally for the World Karting Association, was number two in the state for years behind Danica Patrick, who's racing, you know, NASCAR now, but she was an IndyCar and kart driver back then. And so he was always, you know, fighting for first place with her in the state. And he, we would travel, they would travel, Sometimes when I had my stuff together, I would go with them, you know, out of state. They'd race at Charlotte Motor Speedway, you know, all over the country. So, you know, and I, I had, you know, good times. You know, I got, when we were 15 and 16, my dad took us to Maui. We got to go to Hawaii. So I've got to travel. And for a little bit, when I was, I think, 14, 15-ish, we lived in Toronto for like six months because my dad opened a call center up there. And then, you know, he... uh Ended up closing that down. There was an issue with the real Thelma and Louise that were, the story was based on. One of them worked for his phone company. And so the feds came in. Anyway, he came back down and, you know, opened a place down here. And, uh, you know, um, in 2000, you know, my parents, I didn't, I had lived at a friend's apartment and moved back. They had bought my great grandmother at the time a mobile home. Um, in Clearwater, but she didn't want it. She wanted to stay at the place where she was. She had been there for so long. So when I moved out of my friend's apartment, me and my brother, I didn't have anywhere to live. My brother didn't have anywhere to live. We stayed there for a little bit at the mobile home and of course kept partying and getting into trouble and all that stuff. And, um, you know, just one thing led to another. He ended up moving out, you know, because he just what didn't want to be around all the all the drugs and stuff so um he uh he moved out got his own apartment was doing good was working for my dad at the time working full time you know 50 hour a week 40 hours a week and uh in 2001 in november he had just turned 20 um i you know he had ended up wanting to do something and a friend of mine had gave him some heroin and I guess I didn't know that he had eaten Xanax as well and me and my buddy I had to DJ way out in Tampa that night it was for like an all-night rave type thing so he wanted to just stay at the house he stayed at the house and uh, we went out when we got back at like five in the morning six in the morning he was still sleeping on the couch snoring and everything so I went to bed because he had to be to work in the morning and I was going to try and go to work too. At the time I was trying to you know, maintain a job. And uh, about 8, 30, 9 o'clock in the morning, um, I had to go out and wake him up. And uh, <clears throat> he, you know, he, he had this yellow stuff coming out of his nose. I tried to shake him to wake him up and he wouldn't wake up he i guess he, I, I mean not i guess he overdosed you know and uh so i had to call 911 and um tried to give him mouth to mouth you know put him on the floor on his back i mean he was already blue like you know bluish color and you know just uh my friend was in the house he was freaking out too and, you know, I had to be the one to call the 911 and then call my family after, you know, and explain that their youngest kid, my only sibling, I didn't have any other brothers or sisters, you know, was dead. So, um, you know, I bear a lot of shame and guilt because of that, because I put myself responsible. I was the older brother, at least through the years I did. Um, now I know that you know, he made the choice. I didn't force any. I mean, he called someone else and I knew he was obviously, you know, getting high, but it wasn't something that he hadn't done before. But because 
he had been clean for so long and not really messing with drugs all the time, mixing the opiates with the benzos, that's what ultimately did him in, you know, and, you know, it just, it, it sucks, you know. That was my best friend at the time. We did everything together. We fought a lot, like brothers do. We were only 18 months apart, so it wasn't, you know, we, we were always competing and stuff, but, uh, yeah, so he passed away, and my mom and dad had to come there, and my grandma, my aunts and uncle, it was, it was bad, you know, it was, it, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life, you know, and I've been through some tough stuff, so. Did, did you losing, losing your brother make you change your behavior? Um, not right away, I mean, of course, I was, there was just so much trauma and stuff there, and whatnot that I kept using for a couple months, you know, my parents had told me that if I ever wanted to get sober, you know, they would help me. You know, that they would, you know, they would uh, do what they could do. I mean, they've never bailed me out of jail. They've helped me with lawyers, but they've always made me, they were firm believers in, you know, tough love and, you know, but at that point, after they had lost one of their kids, you know, they did, definitely didn't want to lose me, which I'm grateful for because there's a lot of people out there that don't have family like that, you know, um, and I was very fortunate and blessed and, you know, and it could have been a lot worse. Um, but yeah, I eventually, a couple months later in January, made the call to my dad, you know, and said, hey, what do you want to do? Where do you want to send me? And we both talked about it, and the best place was as far from Florida as possible. So um, they sent me to California to a 90-day treatment center, you know, when I was 21, right before my 22nd birthday. So this was January-ish, end of January in 2002. So, um, went out there, I was th very thankful and grateful and went out there and made the best out of it, you know. A big part of it was, is I think that I was away from here. I didn't have anyone that I could have called to come pick me up or do anything. I was in a complete, I mean, I'd lived in San Francisco when I was a kid, a baby, you know, but I didn't know anybody. And so I gave it my all, you know, I went in there weighing 155 pounds at the age of 21 and came out weighing 205 and working out five days a week and, you know, had a pretty, pretty good head on my shoulders, you know, and then decided, you know, the biggest thing though that was hanging over my head the whole time I was there is I had the violations of probation from when I was younger. So I had to eventually turn myself in and I wasn't going to do it when I was using or when I was high, you know, that's for sure. And it, at the time, it felt tougher because I was sober. I was doing the right thing. I got help. It was almost like a, you know, a kick in the butt that I didn't feel I deserved. But at the same time, I did because I got myself, you know, into that position. And so, yeah, that was tough. I had to come back. And at the time, I had, um, you know, right before that, I had a kid. And his mom basically gave me an ultimatum that if I didn't marry her and get my shit together, pardon my language, but um, I wouldn't see my kid again. And I was 20 years old when he was born. So I kind of called her on her bluff and I haven't seen him since he was six months old. So she held to it, but he's doing good. I mean, she got married and he's got a good stepdad. He's actually, you know, in government works, has been to the White House. He's 21 now, so he's like doing real good. So. Looking back, at the time I was harsh about it, but I, I understand now, you know, why she did what she did, but, so that was another gash in my life, and that happened before my brother died, you know, and so I just, I didn't, you know, didn't have anything to lose, I thought, at that point, you know, had lost so much and went through so much, at least I thought, but uh, eventually, you know, came back after four months of being in California, and I was here for maybe like two or three weeks, and then my attorney made a date for me to turn myself into the court. And uh, yeah, so I got, went to court, turned myself in, was real reluctant at the time, because I knew that, you know, life was gonna stop for a period, and the thing I was worried about was going to prison. That's scary, right? Yeah, of course, I mean. Nine, being, you know, 21, 22. You're going to turn yourself in. Yeah, going to turn yourself in. <laughs> Sober, too, at that. It's like not, 
I mean, I hear a lot of people do it when they're using because then that gives them the ability to get sober in jail and stuff. You've, and I know a lot running, of people. You've been running and free for a long time. And yeah, and doing the right thing and working. I had started working again, you know, at my father's phone company. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was definitely an eye opener, but I had to do it. You know, there was no, no, I didn't want to live as a fugitive any longer than I already did. Because when the worst thing was being in rehab in California, that if I got stopped, because they used to give everybody a, beach cruiser bike to ride around Newport Beach to get from the place where he lived on the beach over to the center, they called it, where you do your meetings and stuff. And uh, the cops used to love pulling people in the rehab over on the bikes because, you know, you didn't have a light or you weren't riding on the side, whatever. And a friend of mine actually from Texas, he had a warrant out of Texas and they pulled him over on his bike and they took him to jail. and. When you're in jail over there, you got to wait for the extradition to come through. If it comes through, and that take can take a month, sometimes more, you know. So that was like a real had to walk on eggshells, more or less. So that's a big, big reason why I stuck to the program. And so, what, what, did, you, what did you end up getting? How much time? Yeah, I ended up. Luckily, the judge took into consideration that I voluntarily went to treatment and stuff, and they ended up giving me uh, nine months. And so he took the year, the thir three months that I went, four months, and knocked it off of a year and a day. He was going to send me to prison. So this was this was just jail. Yeah. So I luckily skated a, a state prison sentence and got a county sentence of you know nine months and was out. At that time, you know, you you get gain time, good time for doing all that stuff. And yeah, so I was in there for seven, about seven and a half months. Got out right before Christmas. You know, went in around May. Got out right in the middle end of December, so it was a nice thing, and you know, got out and started doing the right thing. Got a job, you know. Wanted to be in my kid's life, but I couldn't couldn't really find him. They did their best to keep him away. My, we used to drop off presents for his birthday and Christmas at his grandma's house because his grandma, his mom's mom, and my mom were best friends. That's how I met the girl. She worked for my dad, was a secretary. I met her there. She was had a. I should have known. She had a boyfriend at the time, and you know, kind of cheated on him with me and whatnot. So that should have been a red flag, but I didn't allow it to uh, get in my way. I guess being hard-headed and young still at the time. So, but yeah, I got out, you know, and ended up meeting another girl and having my second son, who is 20 now, um, and but his mom. She, at the time, we didn't know. We thought it was just because she was, she ended up being into drugs, you know, on the side, I didn't know about it. And uh, I basically had to leave her. You know, she ended up having the baby and got Baker acted when she had the baby. So they gave custody to me when he was born. Um, and then come to find out she had a brain, she had brain cancer and she ended up dying. We thought it was just mental issues, you know, because she like, when the baby was born, she was saying how that's not my kid, that's the Antichrist, and saying all kinds of stuff like the FBI was going to take him, like schizophrenic type stuff, you know. And at the time, everyone thought it was because she was either on or coming off the drugs, because drugs will make you hallucinate if you, you know, if you stop taking them abruptly and whatnot. But uh, yeah, so I got custody of him, and she ended up passing away a couple years later, you know, when he was still young from the, you know, the brain cancer. I mean, she got to see him and stuff and he got to see her for a while, but, you know, supervised with his other, his mom's mom, which he sees still to this day and she's a great woman. So, you know, um, but then, yeah, so I, I was doing good, working. I had a full-time job, you know, working 50, 60 hours a week and then worked my way up to getting a salary job, making 50 grand a year doing telecommunications work like programming phone switches and I ran the SMS database which is the toll-free database like if you want an 800 number and you call they have to register it through a central office in Bismarck North Dakota so I had to go up to North Dakota and go to school for a couple weeks was doing <clears throat> real good and then um, started having issues with my wisdom teeth you know and had found out they were impacted so they were gonna have to go in and cut them out and do all this stuff and I was hesitant, but at the time, it hurt, you know, it started hurting real bad, and it was just, you know, we wanted, I wanted to get it taken care of, and uh, after being sober for, 
I think it was almost three, yeah, it was three years at that time, three, four years at that time. It was in 2005, 2000, going into 2006. And uh, that got me back down the rabbit hole because they gave me Vicodin after the surgery. And I knew I probably shouldn't have taken it, but I also wanted to get back to work and, you know, still worked and maintained my job for a while. But uh, stopped taking the Vicodin. But there was this girl that worked at my dad's office that would, you know, she would uh, give me somas. And, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it just kind of makes you... It'll make you retarded, basically, but it, it puts you to sleep, more or less. You know, it can put you to sleep. But, um, and I was taking those and started slacking off in work and eventually lost that $50,000 a year job, you know, which I was mad at the time, but I understand why I got fired, why my dad and his worker... Well, it wasn't my dad that fired me. It was some his partner and, you know, the the lawyer, the lawyer for the company or whatever basically told me that I couldn't work there anymore because I was, you know, nodding off, which I was. At the time, I was real defensive because I'd come a long way in my mind, you know, from where I was doing heroin and Xanax and stuff, but still, anything is going to knock you off course, you know, um, any mind-altering substance, whether it's alcohol or pills, you know. Um, so, yeah, I ended up slipping back into that hole of addiction and did it for about six months and then decided, you know, I needed to, uh, you know, get, get myself right again. Cause my, uh, I had another son, like I said, my second son that I had custody of. So I had to make sure that I was doing what I was supposed to do. And at the time, Suboxone had came out and it was like brand new. And so I, you know, got in that program. I was one of the first like 100 or a couple hundred people in the state of Florida to get on Suboxone which uh, was good at the time. I was, you know, somewhat sober. I mean, you're still taking a pill to get by, but, you know, I was sober from the hard drugs and, you know, was maintaining life, went to go get a work, get a job as a cable installer doing cable TV for the local cable company at the time um, and was doing good and then uh, was out on my motorcycle to go see my daughter one day because um, her mom was at her her mom's house so my my daughter's mother my daughter's grandmother's house and uh so I jumped on the Harley and wanted to go over there and this was in 2007 and uh was going through Tarpon and uh, Palm Harbor and um left the light you know saw this car getting ready to make a U-turn and they uh pulled out right in front of us luckily the guy I was in the second lane the guy inside of me let me, saw that it was coming, you know, that she was pulling out in front of us, let me get over, so so I figured I could dodge her hitting me because I was in the second lane. And instead of going to the third where she was going, I cut to the inside. Well, when she, as we were coming by, she, you know, went to cut the corner, mashed on the gas, and lost control of, of the car. It was a GT Mustang, a Fox Body, like old school 90s Mustang. And she came across all three lanes of traffic, and the bumper hit my leg, broke it in three places, and it sheared my foot off on the on the downpipe, the frame of the bike, because I had forward controls, so my feet were sitting, you know, out in front of you instead of having them underneath the brake and the clutch were out in front, and which lined up perfectly with the frame, you know, the frame bar. And so um, I don't really, I remember coming in and out of consciousness, um, I mean, I remember her hearing her and seeing her out of the corner of my eyes, her tire squealing. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see her coming at me. And then I kind of blacked out. I didn't have a helmet on, wasn't wearing boots like I should have been, you know, didn't boots, have. That's why I saved your foot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I would suggest to anybody that rides a motorcycle. I've never gotten on one since, but always wear boots because the biggest thing is, in, especially in Florida, 80% of the motorcycle accidents are not the motorcyclist's fault. It's other people that don't see them or just aren't paying attention, whatever. You know, a lot of them, granted, are guys on crotch rockets, you know, going 100 miles an hour, driving like idiots, you know, and whatnot. But I was just on a Harley going the speed limit. I actually just came off a stoplight, so I didn't even have time to really get up. I was going about 50 
by the time I got hit, but I had woke up and last thing I remembered obviously is the car coming in. I knew I had blacked out because I just, it was fog and I tried to open my eyes. My eyebrow was hanging in my eye because it was ripped off because I had sunglasses on that were glass, actual glass lenses. And when they shattered, it cut my eyebrow. I had a rock in the back of my head. I just remember coming to and trying to stand up to get out of the road because I knew you know, I'm in the middle of US 19 and uh, that's one of the most deadly roads in Florida. You know, it's, in, it's on the other side of the bay from Tampa, but in Pinellas and Pasco runs through from Pinellas all the way to Tallahassee. But it's, you know, it's a busy road. And so I tried to get up and I just remember trying to put my right foot under me and this throbbing, huge, sharp pain just came in. And the next thing I know, I passed out. And then I woke up briefly hearing the sirens from the ambulance coming. And then they came over and I remember they grabbed my leg. I passed out. I kept, you know, thank God your body goes into shock because that's what was happening. My body kept going into shock and I would pass out, wake back up. And then I woke back up when they put that air cast because they took my foot and tried to fold it back over and then put that blow up air cast, you know, because my leg was broken in three places. So they had to stabilize it, folded my foot back over. I just remember screaming and then passed back out. But they, they reattached your foot? Eventually, yeah. yeah they and, you're, re- and you're walking on your foot now? Yeah, uh, thankfully, I have still got my, I thought numerous times about getting it amputated, but you know, I didn't, that would have been a, after that time of them put reattaching it in the hospital, I was in Bayfront, I had to get helicopter flown. I was in ICU for 32 days. They had to hammer, I woke up because of the Suboxone when they took me in, they couldn't give me any pain medicine, no anesthesia because of the Suboxone has, <laughs> you, has now tracks you, you, you had your foot reattached without, the, without any, the only thing they could give me was an epidural, you know, uh, to numb you from the waist down. Right. But that doesn't, your nerves and all that stuff go to your brain. So I would wake up in the middle of the surgery to them hammering the rods through the bottom of my foot up into my fibula there, you know, into my fibula bone because they had to stabilize it and then they had to drill holes. And this was because you were on Suboxone? Yeah. You couldn't do that? They either. couldn't give me any anesthesia. They couldn't put me to sleep. I didn't know that. No. Because, and that's, <clears throat> you know, that's, Suboxone's a great drug, but, you know, it, it's one of those things where if something, God forbid, something were to happen to you, you know, you've got to really be a strong person. I mean, I, I'm surprised I made it through it, you know, and. I was bedridden for two years after that. You know, I had to, only way I could leave the hospital is I had to have a hook and a pulley installed up in the ceiling and I had to live in a recliner for two years to wear my foot. It was about a year that I had to hang my foot from the ceiling and keep it immobilized and had to, you know, they put two rods, screws in here, one through here and one through the bottom. And then they had these carbon fiber rods that basically branched off to keep it from moving, you know put bolts I've got bolts and wires in it now to you know and I have no movement it's you know that's it oh wow yeah so 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 you stayed on Suboxone after that no <laughs> <clears throat> no I mean I couldn't you know when I they they wouldn't come in and do any of the work because at the time I mean I was road rash I, they had to put all this you know, stuff on my arms, like this drapery on my arms because of all the road rash, because I didn't have a jacket. I was wearing like diesel tennis shoes, a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and glasses and a hat, regular hat. So I had road rash everywhere, you know, all up and down both sides of my body. I've got scars on my back from the road rash. skin grass? What's that? Skin grass? Uh, Yeah, they had to, you know, they had to do multiple on my ankle. I've got a patch missing out of my leg and now they've got They've got uh, synthetics. They're like synthetic skin grafts. It's actually made from, I guess when they circumcise babies, they take the skin and turn it into a skin graft. So mm. I've had multiple of those over the years, you know, um, because of infection and stuff, you know. After two, two and a half, three years, it started healing up, closing up, and it took about four years. So it was about 2011 when it closed up all the way, you know, because it was an open wound 
for the longest time. But it still looks like you might be. Yeah, well, right now I still three, you know, three weeks ago, about a month ago, because I lost my tibial artery when it sheared my foot off, it ripped my tibial artery. So it's like sitting up in the back of my leg. So I don't get the blood flow that I should get from, you know, that I should have. So anytime if I get, I got a lot of dry skin, a lot of skin dis discoloration. And when I would take a shower, if I scrub too hard and cause the slightest little tear in the skin, it eats a hole in it. So yeah, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, that's when that happened. Hmm. And it sucked because I had, you know, I had stopped taking any meds and stuff, so. So you ended up back on? Yeah, I was back on drugs again, you know, after the accident. And then that was, 2007 was the time in Florida when the pill mills were all around, you know, and uh, all that shenanigans that was going on and got on, you know, oxycodone and, you know, yeah, went, went back downhill again after getting back up, got knocked back down and tried to get back up and knocked back down and, you know, stayed like that for a while. Um, and just finally got sick and tired of it. You know, I, I knew that I was either gonna stay in this cycle and be dead. Cause I had, had by this time, not only had I lost my brother, but numerous friends I went to school with that I grew up with had passed away from drugs. Yeah, I mean, the opiate epidemic is a, was a big thing. I mean, it still is obviously, but you know, it took a lot of lives. And um, at that time I was kind of somewhat, I guess, fortunate because I'd been through treatment on and off and, you know, got sober and quit and got sober. And so I knew what had to be done. I just, at the time, wasn't concerned about doing it because I could barely walk. You know, I had to teach myself how to walk again. They told me I may not ever walk again, you know, and just, you know, just had to fight through it. It was, it's, it's, it was tough, you know, especially, you know, when you look back and say, all right, I got my shit together. I was doing good, you know, but it hit, by that point it had happened a couple of times where I was doing good and then fell off the wagon and back on the wagon. So it was just, uh, you know, it was tough, you know, it was tough. And so you're clean of everything. Besides marijuana here. And Suboxone there. and Yeah, yeah. Don't take Suboxone. I don't even take any of the nerve medicine, any of that stuff for my foot because, you know, I probably got issues with my liver with maybe hepatitis or something. So you've gotten addicted and broken free from opiates multiple times. So. Yeah. Yep. And now I you know, now I'm not taking anything because I wanna get my liver, get my teeth done. And my dad said once I get my liver checked out, get a biopsy and see if I you know if I have hepatitis, you know, from needle use and when I was younger, that uh, they've got plenty of medicines out now that can, you know, I've known people that have taken it that have been cured from it. So, um, you know, that's that's one of my next, you know, goals. Quite a ride you've had. Yeah, yeah. But it's, you know, it's all for, it's mainly for myself. You got to do it for yourself if you want to change. I mean, you can have the best family in the world and everyone, but a lot of times that can come in the way because they will enable yeah. You know, if they don't know how to give you tough it's, love. It's, it's a very blurry a, line between enabling yeah, and helping. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, that's one thing that a lot of people got to realize that I've got friends that, you know, cuss their parents up and down because they won't do this for them or do that for them. And it's like, look, if you were doing, you know, showing that you're doing the right thing and then they could help you with certain things. But for so someone to get mad because they're not getting money or so you got to understand that that's come, that's working to your demise. You've got to. You've got to want it yourself. And that was what I found out. There wasn't a kid, a girlfriend, a parent, an aunt, uncle, grandmother, because they all love me, you know, the people I have in my family and life. And it's sad to say that, but until I realized on my own that I was going to make the change and had to make the change for myself first and foremost, and then for my son who I have custody of now, you know, that's, that's the most important thing, you know. I, you can get offered rehab, and I know people that have, me included, that have been in and out of three, four, or five different rehabs, been in and out of jail, and until they want it, there, nothing changes if nothing changes. If you don't make, that was a saying I learned very early on in recovery, and if nothing changes, nothing changes, meaning if you don't make certain changes, whether you get out of the environment you're in, get rid of the old people, places, and friends that you are used to hanging and running around with, 
nothing's going to change. You know, you've got to make slight, subtle, sometimes changes in your life to, to achieve that goal. I mean, I, I've tried to give every excuse in the book to, you know, to keep screwing up and it doesn't, excuses, you know, they're, they're, that's what will get you, you know, to a worse place. You know, and once you can finally be, you know, true to yourself and true to what, what kind of life you're living, you know, you're not going to want to make, you know, any adjustments. All right, Tim. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah, no problem. I'm glad you're doing well. Yeah. I'm, and you're working One today. day at a time. And you're working now. Yeah. Yeah, I do delivery for food and stuff like that on the side. I'm on, I'm on disability, so because I had paid so much in taxes, I qualified for disability. But that's something I want to get off of. Yeah. And you're you know, walking, you have your, you know. Yeah, I've got my foot, I'm walking without a cane. You know, I used to have to have, have a cane and, and stuff, a walker, then a cane. But yeah, no, I'm doing that. I'm able to take care of it. And my kid's four years old now. You know, I can't run with them, but I can take them. I take them to the park a couple times a week and, you know, have to do all this stuff, you know, that entails in taking care of a kid. So. What, what, what have you learned about life after going through all this? Uh, to... Uh, stoicism, you know, being st stoic, that's been a, I mean, it's a hard pill to swallow, but being stoic, which is, you know, accepting the way life is, not making excuses and trying to push yourself through things. I mean, that's the one thing I've learned is that if you don't push through stuff, if you just sit around and feel sorry for yourself, nothing's going to get better in life. Whether you're an addict or not, that's the same, that's the general rule with life in general, whether it's with business or, you know, anything. If you don't push yourself to that highest point, you'll never know what you're fully capable of doing. So, you know, that's why I want to get off a of disability and go back to a somewhat normal life, start a business, repairing electronics. I'm really big into repairing cell phones and computers and stuff like that, so... There's a whole lot of stuff, and that's another thing. you got to find something that you enjoy besides drugs and partying and stuff. You know, you find a hobby or something you liked as a kid, you know, and run with it, you know. Anybody, if I can do it, anybody, you know, with all the craziness that's gone on in my life, you know, I'm sure I know there's people that have had worse situations, but, you know, with the ups and downs and the letdowns, for myself and just life in general, you know, then anybody can do it as far as I'm concerned, you know. All right, Tim. Thank you so All much right. for sharing your story. Thanks, Mark. Right. Good luck. All right.